Hi students, welcome to HSC Earth and Environmental Science and Module 5, Earth's Processes. In this video, we're going to look at the effects of the super cycle on evolution. So we've kind of split um, this particular learning out intention into two halves. We are expecting you to be able to outline the effect of the plate tectonic super cycle on large scale phenomena, including both climate and evolution. And in our last video, we looked at climate. So this time we'll kind of focus a little bit more on evolution. And hopefully um, once you've got those two together, you can then kind of make a comparison, put them side by side and also parallel some of the um, influences that they've had on one another. So we want you to be able to link plate tectonics and evolution. We want you to be able to explain those links and then to contrast what we see happening in terms of um, paleoclimates and also on uh, evolution of past environments. So one of the things that we want to do is we want to see how our understanding of the plate tectonic super cycle has actually um, been an evolutionary driver, has actually contributed to some of the major changes that we see um, happening in the fossil record and therefore reflective of maybe changes that were occurring uh, perhaps in response to not only changes in climate but um, being driven by some of these changes in the um, distribution of both the continents and the oceans. Uh, once again, a big shout out to Mr. Guy at Fort Street High. Uh, some fantastic material which I've used and adapted, uh, and he certainly has put a huge amount of time and effort into the uh, Earth and Environmental Science course, so a big shout out uh, of thanks to him. So plate tectonic forces rearrange continents and ocean basins, and what they do is they alter these environments and we know that one of the important things about evolution, or I guess the three key things that we know about evolution, is that we want variation, we want a selecting agent, something that's going to act on a population, and then of course we want reproduction. Uh, because reproduction is what allows uh, any of those individuals who've uh, been better suited to whatever the selective agent was to be able to pass that selective advantage onto future generations. So the first thing we have to do is we have to have variation within populations. And we've seen um, as we've gone from simple organisms to more complex organisms, we've gone from asexual reproduction to sexual reproduction, which has um, drastically increased the amount of variation. Um, we've also gone from single celled or colonial organisms to multicellular organisms, which once again has uh, enabled specialization, differentiation of cells into specialized cells, and that includes cells that, whose sole purpose is to um, facilitate a new generation uh, as they link together as sperm and eggs. So it's this middle one that's uh, one of the keys to an understanding of how the plate tectonic super cycle has been a driver in evolution and evolutionary change that we see from different paleo environments. Recent research suggests a correlation between levels of speciation, which is the rate of development of new species, and major mountain building events. And those major mountain building events or orogeny are linked to these plate interactions, these cycles of continents coming back together and then fragmenting and moving apart. So we've got a link between these two. Now, one of the important things, I guess, for us to mention at the moment is the difference between correlation and causation. So correlation means there's a sort of a mathematical relationship between these two things, which could be as simple as if one goes up, the other goes up. If one goes up, the other comes down. That's correlated relationships. It doesn't necessarily mean one is causing the other. But what we want to do is see if there's any evidence or exactly how much evidence there is for the association between these different variables. The increase in speciation rates may be the result of release of nutrients from newly weathered land masses and also those uplifted mountain ranges. The stirring of oceans, the nutrients coming from deep within the oceans um, up towards the surface waters may also be a contributing factor. There's a number of things that we can identify as part of this change in diversity. And remember, most of the diversity that we're looking at initially um, is diversity that happened in the oceans. That's where we feel that life began. That's where we feel that um, life diversified in those some of those key events, the, um, the development of the Ediacaran fauna, and also the great diversity that we see in the Cambrian fauna. 
And so these are, um, this is why we look at the oceans, the distribution of the oceans, um, the Panthalassic Ocean, which we'll have a look at um, as we go through uh, in this section, and also at the way that the continents have actually changed the nature of um, some of those oceans from large oceans, smaller oceans, um, trapped water bodies, and so on. One thing that's probably worth mentioning at this point, and, um, and it's only because I, I'm a bit of a fan of Stephen Jay Gould and his writings, he's written a lot of material um, on uh, evolutionary essays, and uh, he partnered with Niles Eldridge and came up with an idea of punctuated equilibrium. So this is, this is a contrast to what's called phyletic gradualism, which is basically that evolution progresses by little tiny incremental steps, one after another after another. The ideas of Eldridge and Gould were punctuated equilibrium, which is basically times of equilibrium or stasis, not much change, and then jumps. So that something happens, the population shifts in some way or another um, just because of maybe a response to geographical isolation, a change in the climate, um, a change in the nature of the mating game, maybe um, certain types of uh, competition, uh, increased competition for mates, uh, anything that could uh, create a selective agent that acts on a population which favours some uh, individuals rather than others, and those ones are the ones that get to reproduce and pass their genes on into future generations. Supercycle events uh, may have contributed to some of the extinction events which we've seen and which may then have also led to higher speciation rates. And we do find, particularly in something like the, the Cambrian, um, an explosion of uh, species all happening at a very short period of time, geologically speaking. Now, we know that um, what we see from uh, one layer to the next in geological time doesn't represent a day or a week or a month or a year. It represents very, very long uh, periods of time. But nevertheless, uh, relatively speaking, we can identify some of these key uh, moments that maybe are part of these changes. There's been a couple of major um, supercontinents. We'll look at some of those in class in a little bit more detail. We've already talked about Pangea, probably aware of Pangaea, Rodinia was another one, and it was a supercontinent that broke apart about 700 million years ago. Associated volcanic activity could have melted what was then the snowball earth and preceded the faunal diversity of the Ediacaran and Cambrian assemblages. So maybe there was something to do with the tectonic, the volcanic activity associated with tectonic movements um, that created this change in the climate and therefore uh, created environments which were going to be more suited to a greater diversity of life. If we move forward a little into the Triassic, now we are looking at Pangaea, this big supercontinent made of uh, Laurasia in the north and Gondwana in the south, and pretty much predating most of the continental movements um, that have led to the current distribution of continents around the globe. But back in this time, you could potentially, if you uh, had enough days and enough energy, have walked from the North Pole to the South Pole. The problem with doing this um, is that there was a large area in the centre of this uh, massive traversing um, that would have made things very, very difficult. There was a very large central desert, very hot, very dry. If you were an organism that was able to, through different types of adaptations, through possessing certain types of traits, uh, survive that sort of uh, an environment and be able to cross into that environment, then there would have been quite significant rewards waiting for you on the other side. Perhaps you might have even stayed in that environment if it was one that really suited um, the set of uh, traits that you had. And this is one of the things that we see. Terrestrial organisms that um, lived in these environments that were crossing these sorts of uh, massive land bridges that now no longer exist, had to be able to adapt to those environments, had to be able to have uh, possess certain traits which enabled them to survive these uh, very hot, dry conditions. So what we see in the Triassic is a range of different types of radiations. There are, there are kind of three dominant groups that we can see, I guess, that uh, with our uh, vertebrate preference on. Um, we tend to look at a lot of the organisms that make up a similar uh, class 
uh, and uh, family to the ones that we do. Um, but we want to try and expand our, our vision a little bit away from our own family, away from um, our own class and to try and kind of go back a little bit further back and have a look at the sorts of different types of um, animals that were dominant. And certainly in the Triassic, we started to see some of um, the dinosaurs appearing. The first of the therapsid reptiles, which were the precursors to the mammals, and also um, a large number and of some very large crocodilians as well. Now, the crocodiles have substantially existed without too much change through to the present time. Mammalian descendants of the therapsids are still around as well, but the dinosaurs are not. And that, of course, depends on, on your opinion about dinosaurs and whether or not you feel that dinosaurs have become birds, in which case they probably, like the therapsids, still exist, just in a different and uh, evolved form. One of the things that we think might have been a contributing factor to the um, speciation, the number of new species that we see in the dinosaurs, was a change in locomotion that actually gave them an advantage in traversing that great landmass in the Triassic. A bipedal body, two uh, legs basically, to be able to walk around on two legs like modern birds do, think kangaroos, humans ourselves, we walk around two, we don't walk around on four, could have made it easier for the dinosaurs to be able to cross these flat, uh, dry landscapes. And Coelophysis is one really good uh, example to have a look at as a, a kind of type species for the sorts of uh, animals that were maybe best suited to this kind of environment. At the time that Darwin was putting all of his work together on evolution via natural selection, of course evolution wasn't Darwin's idea, evolution was around the idea of, ch of species changing, was around long before Darwin, but it was Darwin's idea of natural selection, uh, which is commonly referred to as survival of the fittest, um, that, that has become uh, the model by which we um, assess all living things on earth. But at about the same time, Alfred Wallace, a contemporary of Darwin, was also not only working on similar sorts of ideas, but was coming to similar conclusions as well. In fact, there is a record of him sending um, some of his ideas to Darwin to get his feedback. Uh, the, the, the apocryphal story is that he was uh, Darwin was so concerned that uh, Wallace would steal his thunder from all of this material that he'd been sitting on for years, um, that it sort of pushed him to publish, which is, of course, one of the things in science. You, you get the credit if you publish the paper. One of the things that Wallace did, though, was he emphasised the importance of geographic isolation. We've even got the Wallace line that's in our part of the world, up sort of more towards Indonesia, where you can see a significant change in the faunal assemblages, in the um, range of different types of animals that we see virtually on either side of this line. The fact that they were separated from one another, they um, changed independent of one another, means that they didn't have that opportunity to come back together and, and uh, rebreed with one another. And that's the, the definition of species, that they're not interbreeding. They um, don't, well, I suppose mechanically they may be able to, but they don't produce um, viable offspring. They don't produce fertile offspring, so they can't have any more generations after that first one. And this idea of geographic isolation really fits nicely into the fragmentation idea of the super cycles, which is again part of um, what would have nicely created some of these geographic isolations as the continents were fragmenting and moving apart from one another. They were taking different groups with them, moving them into different environments where maybe they were going to experience some different types of environmental pressures and we see some um, some interesting radiations as a result. I'm conscious that this has been a long video and um, so we will cut to the final chase now uh, and just have a look at something that's kind of really nice for us here in Australia. Firstly, um, the speciation among the ratites, which is the large flightless birds, was uh, is one of the things that we see as a potential area of evidence of evolution through isolation. Now, in this case, what we've tended to see is this kind of, um, I guess, um, ancestral ratite that has then given uh, rise to all of these other very similar types of birds in different types of environments. Uh, in Australia, we have um, the cassowaries up in the north. Uh, we've got our emu. We know that the, the uh, our near neighbours um, in New Zealand have the kiwi, which is probably the, the smallest of 
uh, birds in this particular group. But then in Africa, we see the ostrich no longer have the mower, but it was, it was one of the bigger uh, members of this particular group. So some speciation occurred, a, a group that were kind of filling a niche that they found in, in different geographical environments and that persisted or, or um, held on to some of those key features that uh, we see in this group of birds, uh, but ones that were now um, separate species, so they couldn't interbreed. What's probably an even more uh, elegant and nice example is what we've seen happening in Australia to the marsupials. And one of the nice things that happened in, on Australia is that we had this um, Australian raft, basically just separating from the other continents and, and moving uh, on its own. As a result of that, there was a whole lot of niches in Australia that were not filled and probably would have been filled with some sort of placental uh, equivalent. And so what we've seen uh, instead is what we call adaptive radiation. So uh, a, a species which was probably something like the North American uh, opossum as an ancestor. And then from that, we find this huge radiation, this huge um, diversity into a range of different types of organisms that filled all sorts of different niches from um, honey eaters to insect eaters to um, grazers like the kangaroos um, to burrowers, uh, the wombat or the marsupial moles to hunters like the quolls, the Tassie devil and the Tasmanian tiger. So there's a, and that and that discounts uh, the megafauna. None of the I haven't talked about any of the the huge uh, mammals, uh, marsupials that were part of the Australian environment um, not that many thousand years ago. So we see this, this um, adaptive radiation as a consequence of the movement of continents, the isolation of particular uh, organisms in an environment where the, where the evolutionary pressures, where the selecting agents were slightly different, where niches were perhaps open and it gave them an opportunity to jump into them. You might like to, if you haven't already by the time you've got this far, um, stop this, split it up and have a look at some of these ideas because there's a lot of ideas in this whole area of linking evolution to the plate tectonic super cycle. And of course, we'll look at some specific examples in class. Thanks for watching.